Good afternoon. I'm Adam Lupel, IPI Vice President, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this policy forum, Making Sanctions Smarter, Safeguarding Humanitarian Action. When sanctions hinder aid, the negative impact on civilians is immediate. How do sanctions potentially hinder aid, and what steps can be taken to safeguard humanitarian action under sanctions regimes? This event represents the culmination of a year-long research project on uh, these exact questions, conducted in partnership with the permanent mission of Germany to the UN. So allow me to begin by thanking Germany uh, for its support and for its leadership on this issue. This project has aimed to enhance awareness of how sanctions regimes and their implementation can impact and have impacted principled humanitarian action. It also aims to propose sanctions regimes are effectively implemented while enabling, facilitating, and protecting humanitarian action. Since 1968, the UN Security Council has established 30 sanctions committees, and 14 of those committees are currently in operation, and most having been established since 2003. And a number of those sanctions regimes cover countries in which humanitarian actors currently operate. Since 2004, all new sanctions regimes, UN sanctions regimes, have been designed to be targeted. But this has not eliminated the risk that sanctions may have the adverse consequence of limiting the capacity of humanitarian actors to respond effectively. So, what can be done to better safeguard the space for humanitarian action under sanctions regimes? We have a great panel uh, to discuss this, and this event also represents the launch of a new policy por uh, report, Howard. <laughs> I got to get the, uh, the the photo shot the uh, shot there um, by our former colleague Alice DeBear, who I think many of you know, who ran the uh, humanitarian affairs uh, program here at IPI. Um, it contains case studies of the impact of sanctions regimes on four specific country contexts and uh, helpful recommendations on how to mitigate that impact. Uh, there's copies of the report at the back, recommended highly. Um, I'll have a bit more to say about the paper in a moment, but first we will have opening remarks from Ambassador Jürgen Schulz, Deputy Permanent Representative of Germany to the United Nations. Uh, many of you know him. Ambassador Schulz has been DPR since January of 2017. Uh, from January until July 2017, he served as Vice President of ECOSOC. And uh, particularly relevant for today's discussion in this capacity, he chaired the ECOSOC Humanitarian Affairs segment in Geneva. Um, and since 2018, Ambassador Schultz has been serving as vice chair of the organizational committee of the UN Peacebuilding Commission. Uh, Ambassador, welcome back to IPI. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Adam. Thanks to IPI. And uh, it's a great honor and privilege to be with you all here at this uh, lunchtime, I think the number of uh, colleagues, friends attending this event already shows the interest, and that means the importance of the issue that IPI has chosen. So thanks again to IPI, and I'm also very privileged. We are privileged that we have a great number of outstanding panelists who are going to share their insights and recommendations with us. Just a few words. Um, as you know, Germany is a member of the Security Council uh, um, for two years, 2019 and 2020. This is um, something we take very seriously, and we have a few key priorities during that time. And one of these priorities is exactly about the issue that we are discussing today. It is about um, safeguarding the humanitarian space. It's about strengthening the respect for international humanitarian law and strengthening the humanitarian principles that are key issues for Germany um, and that we really attach a lot of importance to. In the same vein, last year, you, some of you may recall this, Germany and France, during their jumelage, their joint presidency of the Security Council, initiated what we called the Humanitarian Call for Action, 
aiming uh, to compile concrete recommendations and raising general awareness for international humanitarian law. And this is um, not a one time um, event. This is a process that we have launched and we hope to make more progress this year. By now, 43 member states of the United Nations um, supported that call. It was officially launched by the French and German foreign ministers in the context of the Alliance for Multilateralism in September uh, last year. And the call is open for further endorsement by UN member states. So we are salesmen on this uh, and try to gain more support for this important issue. Today's event is addressing an indeed important element of that commitment that is also part of this call for action. And if I may just quote one uh, key uh, message from the call, and I quote, while designing and implementing sanctions regimes, it is important to prevent and in any event minimize the potential negative effect on humanitarian action to make sure that impartial medical and humanitarian action is preserved and that humanitarian and medical personnel are not prosecuted for activities conducted in accordance with IHL and humanitarian principles, unquote. And I think this is very much about the essence of what we want to discuss today. And that is also about the essence of the case studies that IPI has done in this uh, very, uh, very in interesting and comprehensive study that you're going to hear more about in a few seconds. I think one of the key questions is how can we make sure that principled humanitarian action reaches those in need while effectively implementing restrictive measures as decided by the Security Council? And that is certainly a, a challenge that is not an easy um, task. Uh, this needs a kind of nuanced and, and detailed answer and you find a lot of recommendations in the report that will be presented in a few seconds. Now coming back to Germany, we are the um, actually second largest bilateral donor of humanitarian assistance and also of course a current member of the Security Council and we have every interest in promoting such a discussion. And I can also talk about this on a personal level as you have said when Adam, um, I used to serve as a vice president of ECOSOC, was dealing with the humanitarian side of things. Currently, I'm also the head of the Libya Sanctions Committee in the Security Council, so I know, so to say, both sides and both worlds, and I know that to bring these worlds together is, is not easy, but extremely, extremely important. And I think we have already come a long way. A lot of progress has been made. Um, this is today is about making sanctions smarter. That would imply that sanctions are smart to start with, of course, which, which would be good news. Um, but we still have to make them smarter. And I think we have learned some lessons, certainly some lessons from sanctions imposed on Iraq in the 90s in the UN system. Um, and the sanctions landscape, if I can call it uh, like this, has certainly very much improved um, since then. There is, a, there is a consensus that the Council needs to apply targeted, indeed, and smart restrictive measures to work effectively while mitigating unintended negative consequences in the humanitarian sphere. But as the discussion continues, we can't ignore that the efficiency of sanctions on the one hand and the respect for human rights and humanitarian needs on the other hand remain somewhat conflicting interests and issues. So we need to really work hard to connect these two spheres even better uh, than we do it today. And we believe that only when sanctions and counterterrorism experts engage in meaningful dialogue with humanitarian and human rights experts, we can achieve real, lasting, sustainable progress. And with this in mind, Germany has long advocated for reforms of the Security Council sanctions regime, actually. We need to ensure that sanctions are not an undue impediment to humanitarian assistance. Humanitarian actors must be able to perform their work in line with humanitarian principles and international humanitarian law. And exemptions for humanitarian action in sanctioned regime, regimes play an important role in guaranteeing this. And we need to use this instrument even more often and more effectively than we do today. Now before concluding, let me also say that uh, together with Mexico and Switzerland, Germany hosted a series of talks in 2018 and 2019 on this topic. And together with IPI, we hosted an expert meeting here at IPI actually last May. That was also exactly about this challenge that we have to overcome. 
And the paper that we are discussing here today is an important contribution to this discussion. The proposals in the paper, as you will hear in a minute, cover a broad array of subjects, but it is also a paper that is not just describing the challenges and the situation, it also suggests very concrete steps that different actors can take to improve the situation. And I think that is the most important and most essential part of this, obviously, because we all want to come up with some policy recommendations at the end of the discussion so that we do better than we do today. I'm sure that together we can find solutions for safeguarding principles, humanitarian action, while increasing the efficiency of UN sanctions regimes. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Ambassador Schultz. That gets us off to an excellent uh, start. And again, thank you uh, to you and to Germany for your leadership on this issue, um, in particular highlighting the humanitarian call for action, which I hope uh, many more member states uh, sign up on uh, um, beyond the 43. Um, and also, I think that um, I, I, I think your, your point about looking ahead, looking for steps to improve the situation, and recognizing that, you know, uh, the uh, as you say, to say that uh, we want to make sanctions smarter assumes that they're smart. Um, there's a lot of work left to be done, but we do have to recognize that the sanctions environment has improved uh, since, uh, since the 90s and, and, and later. Um, we have three great speakers for you today. Um, let me say a couple words on that, and then, uh, and then I'm going to say a few words about the paper. Um, Sue Eckert here to my left, the Honorable Sue Eckert. Uh, is a renowned expert on sanctions and de-risking, adjunct senior fellow at the Center for a New American Security and former U.S. Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Expert, uh, Export Administration. Chris Harland is Deputy Permanent Observer and Legal Advisor at the ICRC's delegation to the United Nations in New York. And Julien Piacciabello is Humanitarian Affairs Officer at the uh, UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. You have full uh, bios in your handout, so I won't go into lengthy um, introductions. There is, of course, a fourth voice that is missing here, and that is the author of the paper that I've referenced earlier, Alice de Baer. Um, she unfortunately could not uh, be here today, but I'm going to take the mo uh, a moment, take the moderator's privilege um, to briefly present a few of the key points uh, from uh, her work, from the research project and her paper before turning it over to comments from our panelists, and then we should have quite a, a bit of time for Q&A, so we have a wealth of expertise in the room. Through... Um, an analysis of the sanctions regimes surrounding Afghanistan, the DPRK, Somalia, and Syria. This research project um, discusses and reveals in many ways seven different ways that sanctions regimes can impact humanitarian action. Um, and I'm just gonna go through them briefly. First is the possible listing of humanitarian organizations on a sanctions list. This would be the most direct an immediate risk to a humanitarian organization or one of its staff members. Two, the, the very time and resources that it takes to apply for possible exemptions. Um, this requires a very significant investment and can, can create a drain on the effective delivery of aid. Three, de-risking. In, um, that is, in seeking to mitigate their risk uh, operating under sanctions regimes, banks and other private sector actors sometimes restrict or refuse to provide services to humanitarian organizations. Uh, notably, in the DP, uh, DPRK, for example, there's actually no banking channel for humanitarian actors. Four, restrictions on the importing of specific goods. Restrictions on dual-use items, including such basic items as uh, cement or uh, tubing of various sorts, um, can delay or block imports of important humanitarian goods. Five, restrictive clauses in donor agreements. Such clauses can increase costs, limit flexibility, and challenge the impartiality of humanitarian operations. Uh, six, fines and potential prosecution. Humanitarian actors risk being fined or prosecuted for having violated sanctions. Um, this 
Final point, fines and prosecution, as I understand it, uh, has not been a prevalent problem so far, but the very risk contributes to the seventh and final uh, potential impact, and that is uh, what is called the chilling effect. All of the above challenges often lead, far too often lead, humanitarian actors to err on the side of caution self-regulating beyond what is legally or contractually required. In Afghanistan and Somalia, for example, humanitarian organizations have avoided working in large parts of the country outside of government control, in part to avoid the very risk of violating sanctions. Uh, the paper goes into detail on each one of these uh, um, challenges. Depending upon the context, some of these points are, are potential, some are, are actual. But one of the key conclusions of this project is that the adverse impact on humanitarian uh, activities in a number of concrete contexts is, is clear. And there is an emerging consensus that this indeed presents a real uh, challenge. So um, while there are no straightforward solutions to these problems, one of, the, one of the lessons that I've come out of being engaged in this, in this project to some degree is the real complexity uh, of these issues. The paper details um, a number of ways forward, and I'll be really brief and general in this for now. Um, these include um, adding more precise language that safeguards humanitarian activities in sanctions regimes, raising awareness and promoting dialogue on these issues. Hopefully this event will contribute to that. Conduct, conducting better and more systematic monitoring and reporting on the impact of sanctions. Developing more and improved guidance on the scope of sanctions regimes and increasing support for risk management and better risk sharing. Um, there's a lot of detail in the, in the report, which also uh, identifies specific recommendations for specific actors. Um, we'll maybe touch upon a little bit of that in, in, the, in the presentations and the discussion, um, but uh, uh, it's available in the back of the room, online, I recommend it highly. Um, but enough for me. I am actually not the expert on these issues. So without uh, further comment, I'd like to turn to our first speaker, uh, the Honorable Sue Eckert, who is currently a uh, consultant to the World Bank Stakeholder Dialogue on de-risking. We were talking a little bit about this before uh, in, the, in, the, in the room before. It's, uh, it's fascinating and it might be a very complex area of work. Sue, enlighten us. The floor is yours. Adam, thank you very much. Um, and. Congratulations to IPI for this report. Um, I'm only sorry that Alice was not able to be here. I think she has made a very significant contribution to the understanding of the unintended consequences of sanctions um, to humanitarian action. But in particular, I'd also like to recognize the very important role that Germany has played here, not only in sponsoring this research, but uh, focused on the importance of humanitarian action and sanctions. In 2015, they were part of the high-level review of UN sanctions and actually chaired the subgroup that focused on, on these issues. They're also sponsoring uh, research, I think, uh, of the group uh, SWP in Berlin that's focused on implementation and management of sanctions. So these are complicated issues, and it really takes a commitment to, um, to focus on the, the specifics. This isn't a new problem. I mean, this is, we, it, doesn't, it didn't occur overnight. It's not something that we haven't heard of before. It was highlighted in the context of the HLR, and in particular, we called for a, a standing exemption for humanitarian actors. What is new, however, is the increasing body of evidence about the scope and the um, magnitude of these challenges. In 2017, oh, my kids usually say I don't need a microphone to be heard, but um, in 2017, there was the first empirical study of US nonprofits, and I'm gonna use the term NPOs today because that's the term that FATF uses. It refers to the broad range of charities and non-governmental organizations dealing with development and humanitarian assistance. 
But the, the first report, empirical study, found that two-thirds of all US NPOs were affected by financial access challenges. The following year, the UK released a study that found that 80% uh, of UK NPOs were um, suffering problems. And then um, you can look at almost on a, you know, a regular basis in the newspaper. Voice of America yesterday had a uh, headline that said, Charity, 1.2 million Nigerians beyond humanitarian access. So as Adam noted, there are the seven areas in which uh, regimes, uh, sanctions regimes impact humanitarian action. Um, my colleagues uh, who are much more um, knowledgeable about the humanitarian sector will address, I'm sure, the, quote, the notion of sanctions in um, uh, exemptions in sanctions regimes. So I wanted to talk about two very briefly, and that is de-risking and then also um, conditions in uh, donor agreements. De-risking is a term, de-risking uh, uh, financial access difficulties, whatever you want to call it, but it's basically uh, banks or financial institutions limiting their, their support of transferring funds. Um, it can take the, the form of closed bank accounts or actually a failure to open bank accounts for charities, uh, which a number have experienced. In, in greatest part, however, it results in the delays of wire transfers. And, and in particular, this is uh, extremely uh, uh, important because of the critical nature of humanitarian assistance. This literally can mean life and death in terms of getting funds to the location. If the fuel runs out, they're not able to get more fuel, the generator shuts down, a hospital doesn't operate. People don't get food. So it, timing is extremely important. But one of the most disturbing aspects, I think, when, uh, of the studies is non charities and nonprofits have a can-do attitude. They will get the assistance where it needs to be. And so when formal financial channels are cut off, what they do is they have to resort to the use of cash and informal value transfer systems. We found that 42% of NPOs were resorting to the use of cash, 30% at the time for in uh, money transfer systems. Both of those, I mean, first, by the way, in terms of carrying cash, is extremely risky, both for individuals who are delivering the assistance and for the organizations. But both of those are contrary to what our counterterrorism objectives are, which is traceability and transparency of funds movements. Um, and this is happening, by the way, at a time when we have historic need. OCHA's 2020 report noted that nearly 160, 168 million people will need humanitarian assistance and protection this year. That's about one in 45 people in the world, and this is the highest figure in decades. Um, restrictive clauses I just want to briefly address. Due to concerns over sanctions and terrorism, more and more donors are putting in place clauses that basically say you need to take care of the risk associated with this. They don't tell you how, they just say do it. This is uh, the ill-defined conditions that increasingly have become a commonplace in the government contracts has really had the effect of making many NPOs have to face, can they continue delivering assistance in this area? Um, and it has led to uh, the departure of a number of nonprofits and providing such assistance in, in key areas. Unfortunately, but because of the way it's a, uh, it is a, a wholesale uh, uh, transfer of risk, I should say, it's not government sharing in the risk with NPOs, it's transferring the risk to banks and NPOs. It's very natural that banks are going to be reluctant when you don't get support from the government. So it's, um, from my perspective, and one of the things that we focused on is governments have to be partners. That government, the nonprofits, and the banks are all stakeholders. Um, and you have to be realistic that there's no situation without risk. But the, but the job of the bank and the job of the humanitarian sector is managing that risk in partnership with government. So these are complicated issues, as Adam noted. Um, in the number of years I've been dealing with sanctions, I think this is probably the most, most challenging, um, but also the most important, because we're not talking about just an issue of concern to those you know, policy wonks. These are people's lives that we're talking about. This has a real impact. 
they're complicated in many ways because you're dealing with a whole range of actors. You're dealing with, in the UN, 1267, the other sanctions regimes. You're dealing with foreign policy and security objectives of government. Um, you're dealing with the illicit finance side of governments, and that is the regulatory bank regulators, who have never really engaged in, in international discussions in this regard. Um, you're dealing with donors and the humanitarian assistance and foreign aid sectors, and they've not necessarily dealt with a number of these issues in the, pack, in the past. The financial sector has experienced the single um, largest uh, fines. There's a fine uh, a couple years ago of almost $9 billion for violations. So it's, it's natural that financial institutions are going to look at these responsibilities with uh, a risk uh, appetite, which unfortunately has declined over time. The humanitarian sector, the MPO sector, has learned a lot over the last several years, over the last decade, about what effective due diligence means. But in total, you have these different stakeholders who don't really understand and haven't understood each other in the past, have never actually had to deal with each other. And so it's, there's a lack of a common language and understanding on these issues in which I would say it's not uncommon for these communities to be talking past each other. So um, I let me just make a couple uh, concluding points, observations. My, from my perspective, as someone who has dealt with sanctions over the years, the unintended consequence of these things is actually to damage the reputation and the efficacy of the sanctions tool. Uh, a number of years ago, the lack of due process was something that very much uh, posed a challenge for the continued efficacy of UN sanctions. That was addressed. They put in place an a, a Omsburg person. It's not perfect. There are things that could be done. But the point is that they um, actually addressed the issue. In this particular one, I don't think that we've had an addressing of the issue. Um, former Secretary of Treasury Jack Lew actually characterizes this is not a conflict of interest. This is uh, a need to bring together parallel interests. And it's about risk and how you manage risk. So humanitarian and actors can't be left to shoulder all the burden of risk that uh, uh, stems from operating in, in conflict regions. Nothing is risk-free, but that's all the more reason why the governments uh, have an obligation to provide this kind of uh, guidance. All stakeholders have a, have a stake in this. Charities don't want their funds to go to the wrong place. Banks don't run them, and nor governments either. But what is required um, is specific action. And here, the report recommends um, some very good recommendations. And generally, I just say that on the first, with regard to um, including language that safeguards humanitarian activities, little progress, little progress here at the UN. Right, the second, which is raising awareness and promoting multi-stakeholder dialogue. Here, we have made progress. I think that, in particular, the Dutch government, the British government, the US, um, through the World Bank process, the French government are actually engaging in stakeholder dialogues where all the parties sit at the table to understand the nature of the problem and to try to work through this. The Swiss government has sponsored the compliance dialogue, which is focused on humanitarian uh, transfers into Syria. So I think that we've had a good uh, basis of understanding, but there is far more that needs to be done. On the third, about conducting better, more systematic monitoring and reporting of the impact, I would note that CTED now has a mandate to look at some of these issues. But I want to caution, um, this should not be an excuse for inaction. When you don't want to do something, you always study an issue. Have you noticed that? But we already know what the problem is. The problem exists, it's a serious and systemic problem, and we need to do something about it. There are significant real world effects on developing more uh, guidance and improving with risk management and risk sharing. There's really little real concrete progress, though as I said, I note that the Swiss government and the, e the EU through ECHO are leading a compliance dialogue focused specifically on Syria. So there, there has been progress. I think um, there are tools that have developed Save the Children and has developed what's called Lotus 20, which is a closed loop voucher system to provide um, funding into uh, areas that they're providing assistance. It's in te test phases now. 
other NPOs also have and looking at blockchain technologies. That's very important. There's something TechSoup is actually talking, uh, is developing, and we'll have this later this spring, a repository of all due diligence information about NPOs. Any NPO that wants to put their information there, banks can access. It would make it easier for banks to do their due diligence. Um, and then there are other things as well. Um, but these are all managing the problem. They're not solutions. And, and with that, I'd just like to conclude that the central role of the United Nations in this. If there are no measures, um, exemptions, or exceptions in UN Security Council resolutions, there is no legal basis for many co other countries or the EU to take action. And here, this is, it's absolutely essential that as the UN sets the scope of sanctions, um, that defining vague references like IHL and humanitarian activities, they have been insufficient for safeguarding humanitarian actions. At the EU level, um, the restrictive measures cannot be um, um, ameliorated if you don't have the sanctions exemption in the UN. So my uh, concluding thought is that I think that this report is an excellent beginning here of discussion at the UN. UN Security Council Resolution 2462 began that earlier uh, in 2019. But I think this report and the goodwill of member states and the security and foreign policy objectives of member states um, will actually constitute a new beginning, I hope, for a constructive dialogue to actually make progress on these issues. Great. Th thank you. Thank you. He asked Adam what the sanction was, and he said there was no sanction going on. <laughs> well, you had me. You had me roped in there. A lot of great uh, uh, in, insight there. And you know, I mean, you, you started with this question of what is new. What is new is that we really do have a body of evidence now about the impact of sanctions regimes on humanitarian aid, and it's incredibly striking the statistic that you cite: two thirds of U.S. nonprofit organizations, eighty percent in the UK that suffer from uh, the lack of financial access, um, and that really calls out for, for action. It reminded me of part of this project, uh, you were part of it, we had a uh, expert level roundtable uh, last year, and if you recall, there was a gentleman from Standard Chartered who, who presented um, uh, at that round table, and I recall listening to him going through the procedures that they have to take in order to de-risk. And I was thinking at the time to myself, like, well, I mean, I, it's, they are to be forgiven if they're not you know, uh, uh, providing financial access to, to people. Um, but then you know, the, the, the next step is, is to highlight what you, what you called parallel act, uh, interest. Or there's a com we have to recognize that there's a common interest of the financial sector, of the nonprofit sector, of the UN to address these issues because um, there are real problems that need to be addressed. You, this, this also I thought was very striking, these unintended consequences to the humanitarian sector is going to do their level best to reach people in need no matter what. And then there's the issue of, well, then if they don't have financial access, they're going to use cash, which then works in cross purposes to many of the, of the other agendas and the UN, uh, um, of UN activities, and uh, which then uh, leads me to your point about multi-stakeholder dialogue. This is an issue that requires uh, kind of uh, everyone on deck to, to address. And uh, um, I think um, hopefully that's one area where you can really make progress to bring people around the table to discuss in more detail. Um, so uh, with that, let me turn it over to uh, uh, Chris and the ICRC to give us uh, his insights on the ICRC perspective on these issues. Chris, please. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, thank you also to the International Peace Institute uh, for the invitation to speak here today. And of course, to Germany for its uh, support uh, to IPI's important uh, work. I bring greetings from Robert Mardini, who sends his regrets that he was unable to be with us today as advertised. Uh, I want to congratulate uh, Alice Debar for her outstanding work on the paper and apologize, uh, Adam, for snatching her away from IPI to work uh, in the International Committee of the Red Cross's Brussels delegation. Uh, two years ago, uh, IPI was carrying out research relating to counterterrorism measures and their impact on medical and other humanitarian activities. Uh, this awareness raising was important in the work of the Security Council on counterterrorism financing, notably in 2019 and resolutions 2462 and 2482. 
Uh, these resolutions urge states to take into account the potential effect of those measures on exclusively humanitarian activities, including medical activities that are carried out by impartial humanitarian actors in a manner consistent with international humanitarian law. So it's right and proper uh, for the IPI to take credit for being part of the push to seek greater awareness of and protections for humanitarian action in armed conflict in the CT space and not only at the Security Council. Two months ago, uh, the Council of the European Union uh, followed this up with its own conclusions, agreeing to seek to avoid any potential negative impact on humanitarian action when it comes to EU CT measures and sanctions regimes, uh, which is an important political statement, we feel. Uh, this was coupled with an obligation uh, in the same conclusions to comply with IHL when implementing such uh, regimes. Allow me to be clear, of course, states have every right to take measures to protect their citizens from acts of terrorism, including attacks on civilians, which are prohibited as war crimes under the laws of war. Terrorism negates the principle of humanity. The ICRC condemns acts of terrorism, whether committed within or outside armed conflict, and irrespective of the perpetrators. We are deeply distressed by the devastating impact of these acts on communities and individuals. But we're talking about sanctions here today. Likewise, certain sanctions measures outside counterterrorism frameworks are often designed to bring about a better humanitarian situation for individuals in each context. Unfortunately, however, we have paradoxically seen sanction systems which also negatively impact principled humanitarian action. Mitigating measures protecting principled humanitarian action would be needed, we feel, in such cases. However, impartial humanitarian action in armed conflict, which saves lives, must also be encouraged and given the space it needs to function fully as foreseen under IHL. This includes ensuring that safe drinking water, visits to detainees, and basic medical care continue to exist, even in areas controlled by groups which may carry the label of terrorist or in countries where sanctions are designed to carry out political change. Finding the right balance between these imperatives is an, is an ongoing process. While some progress has been made, much work remains to be done. If some measure of success can be seen following the previous IPI work on CT and humanitarian action, what should we now expect from this work on the humanitarian impact of sanctions? I would make three points. First, on impact. In summarizing its work, IPI highlights seven areas in which it observes humanitarian work has been impacted. At the ICRC, we are currently undertaking an evidence gathering effort on the impact of both CT and sanctions measures on our work, and on the impact felt especially by communities where we are active. But already, we've seen the impact in donor funding arrangements, including reporting requirements, which in certain cases limit where we are able to work. Some proposed clauses in funding agreements in practice prevent work in opposition-controlled areas. The prospect for criminal prosecutions for our staff limits what we are able to do, even if this is more often due to counterterrorism measures, in large part because they're more global than targeted sanctions. We also see limitations placed on our ability to deliver, deliver goods in certain operations. Uh, for example, uh, military sanctions have prevented us from importing medical suits uh, to address the Ebola virus. Very broad sanctions regimes that include any indirect support of any economic resource to communities where targeted individuals and groups are present offer similar challenges. Second, on the five major proposed recommendations in the report, these align with much of our thinking. Humanitarian exemptions, such as those which currently exist in Somalia, or which existed in 2000 in Afghanistan, would assist us in providing protection and assistance to communities affected by armed conflict. Such exemptions include humanitarian activities by relevant impartial humanitarian organizations operating in a manner consistent with IHL. Greater clarity in understanding the contours of sanctions restrictions may also be useful, in particular if guidance is given which appreciates the importance of impartial humanitarian action. Third, practically, where do we go from here? We look forward to working with council members on options that may be available as sanctions resolutions come up for renewal. Uh, 
We recommend council members bear in mind IPI's conclusions in doing so. So practically, in a sanctions renewal process, what are some of the things that we might suggest council members consider doing? It could be useful to ask whether there may be room to consider humanitarian exemptions beyond the Somalia context. So in, 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 uh, in, in, in the remaining uh, uh, contextual um, sanctions regimes. As renewals are being negotiated, it's appropriate to ask in each case, we believe, what types of humanitarian safeguards would be appropriate for that context? So that's the first thing we would ask. As the renewal comes up, ask what types of humanitarian safeguards would be appropriate for that context. Secondly, it should be possible to have each sanctions regime monitor and report on the humanitarian impact of the regimes. It should be possible also to have regular humanitarian briefings in each context. As Sue mentioned, the 2015 high-level review of UN sanctions linked the two, recommending the following. And this is what it said. Regular, standardized, evidence-based assessments should be conducted to consider the extent to which the proposed measures may impact humanitarian initiatives. If concerns exist that sanctions could impact humanitarian action, the Council should consider standing exemptions for UN humanitarian actors and implementing partners in that situation. Third, it may also be possible in the renewal of sanctions resolutions to stress some of the impact that may be felt on principled humanitarian action in the context concerned. And we have wording, for example, in 2462, later in 2482, broader than just financing, uh, which may prove useful, useful as a starting point. Such wording could also specifically reference the need for mitigating measures where that could be agreed to. And fourth, it should be possible to reiterate the need to comply with international law, including IHL, where those sanctions regimes involve areas of armed conflict. This has been done already in some resolutions, such as 2214 regarding Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State group. But not all resolutions have this express wording. Why is that important? Because such language, we feel, it may also prove useful as states transpose these obligations into domestic law. So where you have a resolution that starts in the United Nations Security Council and is transposed, for example, either directly or, for example, through the European Union structure, if you have wording in there specifically mentioning obligations under international humanitarian law or international law in general, it may then be possible for the transposing state to then look at the obligations in IHL when crafting the specific contours for the domestic system of that state. In conclusion, uh, impartial humanitarian action must be possible, even in situations where sanctions regimes are in place. Undertaking our protection activities, ensuring food delivery, clean water, and medicine to those in the greatest need must still be possible. We look forward to being part of these discussions to find the right balance. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chris, so much. First of all, thank you for highlighting the, uh, the impact of IPI's past work on counterterrorism uh, and humanitarian action. You know, we, um, we uh, giving us a fair amount of credit, probably maybe more for credit than we deserve, but we've got you on camera. <laughs> uh, so we're going we're gonna to quote you on, on that. So thank you so much. It's really, uh, really heartening to hear. Um, and also for, for providing some real concrete examples from the ICRC's experience that relate directly relate to some of the challenges we've outlined. I'd just like to, to one comment on this this proposal, this idea of, of using the sanctions renewal process to ask some of these questions, I think uh, that, that uh, gives me some, some real thought it, and it reminds me of a project that we have at IPI related to peacekeeping operations that uh, uh, coming out of the uh, high-level independent panel on peace operations and the need to do a better job of, of sequencing and prioritizing um, Security Council mandate for peacekeeping, you could think of something similar uh, for sanctions regimes, and we could gather discussions prior to those um, renewals to ask these 
questions very directly. And as you say, I think it would be really appropriate to ask what exemptions uh, would be helpful in any given context. So I think that's a real concrete and a helpful suggestion. Um, let's, uh, let's now turn to, uh, to Ocha for um, Julianne, give us your uh, insights from the field and other, other aspects of Ocha's work. Julianne, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the, from the headquarters, let's say. Let, let's say the perspective from headquarters about you know, what happens in the field. L l let's put it that way, informed by the, by the field. Um, I'd like to, to, to join first my, my, my fellow panelists in, in thanking really IPI for its sustained involvement in, in, in pushing this issue. And of course, in congratulating the author of, of the IPI report, uh, Alice, I think she did a great job. Ambrose said that she's not here today. At the same time, I'm kind of relieved that she's not here because I wouldn't have anything to say uh, <laughs> because she knows so much about the topic. So uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank also Germany for the same kind of sustained involvement. Uh, as Sue recalled, uh, back in 2015, it was already Germany who pushed for the high-level review of human sanction to include a humanitarian dimension and for a specific a dedicated working group uh, to look into these aspects. And one of the conclusion of this group uh, back in 2015 was that the move from comprehensive embargoes to targeted sanctions actually did not prevent some sanctions, some UN sanctions regimes from having a humanitarian impact. And the same could be said uh, about some unilateral sanctions regimes. Um, to begin with, uh, some sanctions regimes, some current sanctions regime, are not that targeted. Um, the, the UN Special Rapporteur on Unilateral Coercive Measures says that they are not intended to be smart. Um, that's his view. Uh, the sanctions on Syria, for example, the sanctions on the, the DPRK, I mean, uh, Alice's report contains very good examples. I mean, they prohibit the, uh, a range, they contain a range of prohibitions, including um, prohibition on the transfer of a wide range of, uh, of commodities, including some commodities that are essential to key civilian infrastructure. Um, some other regimes, even if they are more targeted, um, they may have an economic impact, which in fragile situations can quickly translate into humanitarian needs. The 2011 um, sanctions regime in Libya was used as an example during the 2015 high-level review of that, that type of sanction that may have an economic impact because they, target, they are targeted, but they target governments, which control basic public services. They target key economic sectors, and they target... Um, and they target central banks. So they end up having this impact even though they are targeted. Um, and finally, even if targeted, sanctions can have an impact on the humanitarian response. I'm saying can have because, of course, not all sanctions regimes have the same uh, impact. It depends on several things, that their, their scope, but also the way uh, that member states implement them, depending on whether a particular sanctions regime correspond to a priority for them or not. Um, and sometimes the impact is also multiplied by the fact that several restrictive measures will apply at the same time, UN sanctions, unilater unilateral sanctions, counterterrorism measures. So in that case, the impact is both multiplied and more difficult to attribute to a specific uh, regime. All these measures, they have something in common. They, they aim at preventing resources from being made available to their targets. And um, from that perspective, humanitarian action is seen as a risky business sometimes even an illegitimate uh, business. So very often the, the humanitarian impact, it's a result of um, several restrictive measures that are combined with states risk aversion in the implementation of some of these measures. Um, this impact, I mean, the, the last IPR report really does a great job at, at anal analyzing this impact. It breaks it down into seven categories as Adam described. <laughs> For the sake of simplicity and from a practical standpoint, they, they, they really boil down to two types of impact, I would say, one on efficiency and the other one on impartiality. Um, on efficiency, first, again, the report is full of example. We've seen that the, the implementation of sanctions in, in, in a lot of cases means going through lengthy, costly, 
uh, at times unclear administrative processes, licensing processes. I have to say that NGOs are more affected than UN agencies by that because in many cases we, we, we have exemptions that they cannot use. But there is a huge impact on the humanitarian sector as a whole. Um, there's also the question of very heavy due diligence to prevent aid diversion. And here I would say it's a question of of balance more than uh, a, a question of principle. It's a question of balance because in principle, uh, uh, fighting a diversion is a humanitarian imperative before being something that is requested by sanctions. We have an imperative, we have an obligation to ensure that uh, the, the, the grants uh, and the aid that, that, that goes to the persons who need it and do not serve any other purpose than responding to needs. That's our obligation and it's been a while that the humanitarian sector has been professionalizing its operations and putting in place of some very serious due diligence when we should probably be, be, be better at explaining and communicating on those due diligence. Uh, but um, in the context where we operate, a uh, zero risk policy is just not feasible. Uh, that's, that's a cold fact and a lot of donors today don't want to hear that. What they want is a, is a zero risk policy. We can see that some accidental cases of a diversion can lead to very heavy penalties. We can see that uh, um, dealings with vendors uh, that will be remotely linked to a listed individual uh, even without the knowledge of that kind of link may lead to very severe penalties also. So. Adam said it, that there are very few cases of actual prosecution, but the risk is here. And generally, the national authorities don't do anything to kind of dissipate that risk. They don't provide clarification. They are not willing to provide any assurance that unintentional cases of aid diversion are not going to be prosecuted. The banks face the same risk, and the impact on humanitarian operations is very well documented. Uh, an ODI report that was published in 2018 found that a third of donor funding was held by banks uh, in originating countries between four and six months before they can be transferred to Syria, which means that at any point in time, the NGO community in Syria, the amount of cash available to the NGO community in Syria was reduced by 35%. International vendors have also been reluctant to export commodities uh, to some countries, same for insurance companies, transportation companies, sometimes they have imposed some exorbitant conditions. Um, now, beyond efficiency, the implementation of sanctions can compromise impartiality. Uh, the ODI study I mentioned um, mentioned that of 60 NGOs interviewed from the study, only four, um, only four, uh, uh, sorry, only only six of them said that they had not uh, modified programming in order to prioritize the less contentious areas and projects. So in practice, it means that all the others have admitted uh, changing the priorities in their programming, changing their priorities in order to limit the risk of aid diversion, but in a way that does not necessarily prioritize the most urgent, the most acute needs. Uh, and donors have also sought to impose obligations that influence programming in the same direction. Um, requirements in grants that the grants not be spent in certain areas or, or uh, requirements that beneficiaries be vetted against sanctions list. Uh, we, we have seen that in, 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 in some cases. One sort of impact that is a bit less documented, uh, it's the potential impact on the perceived politicization uh, of humanitarian assistance. You have some practices that can make humanitarians appear as active agents, not only complying with, but active agents in the implementation of sanctions. So for example, when humanitarians are requested to share information for listing purposes, when humanitarians are uh, requested to share information on already listed uh, entities without any guarantee in terms of confidentiality of the information, or when UN agencies are requested by donors to vet uh, their partners against sanctions lists that are not UN sanctions lists. That that makes us in practice instrument in the implementation of unilateral sanctions regime with all the, the, the consequences in terms of politicization, uh, politicization that you can imagine. At the end of the day, it can have consequences on safety and on access. So how can we make sanction, sanctions smarter? I'm not going to repeat everything that has been said, just maybe a couple of points that I, I, I would see as priorities. First, 
I would like really to underline the role of the Security Council, and I would like to underline it because, as obvious as it can uh, seem, um, not all people agree that that it's important. Uh, during the high-level review of UN sanction, we had one member state who said, "Well, why do you recommend the generalization of general exemptions uh, in UN sanctions regime?" it will be completely useless because at the national level and at the regional level, there's no such exemption. The IPR report, uh, it gives the example of DPRK and it shows that you can have uh, a license from the DPRK sanctions regime. You still need to have licenses from national authorities that are involved in the transfer of commodities in order to be able to actually uh, transfer assistance and fund to the DPRK. So yes, granted, the Security Council action is not sufficient. But I think that as Sue said, uh, as Chris said, uh, that's an essential first step because if you don't have the possibility of licenses or general exception at the level of the Security Council, the, the EU is not going to have that in their implementing measures and a number of member states will feel that they don't have the legal basis to have that uh, in their implementing measures. So that's really important. Another thing that the Security Council might want to do is short of, uh, of, of, of exception would be to provide clarity uh, on how in its views the sanctions should apply to the humanitarian sector, uh, how they should apply to humanitarian activities. The, you could have sanctions committees providing implementation guidelines because in any case state implementation is what will ultimately make a difference. You need to have security council action but you need to have states following suit. Uh, states can adopt humanitarian exception. They can also ensure that principal humanitarian action is not criminalized and that unintentional cases of aid diversion do not give way to crippling penalties. They may provide also for the possibility of licenses, but also make the obtention of licenses accessible and swift and work with other states to ensure the mutual recogni recognition of specific licenses. That would go a long way, I think, to facilitating humanitarian assistance. Finally, states are best place to create space for dialogue. What we would need is regular engagement between humanitarian organizations, law enforcement bodies at the national level, and the private sector in order, in order to at least agree on due diligence that would satisfy the sanction implementation arm and at the same time be acceptable from a principled humanitarian standpoint. Ideally speaking, would have guidance and minimum standards on due diligence, and even more ideally, compliance with these minimum standards would, would provide some sort of a guarantee of non-prosecution in terms of unintentional uh, um, aid diversion. So there are solutions, but it will take the involvement of multiple actors, strong political will, and it will require accepting that humanitarian consideration justify a reasonable share of risk. Thank you. Great, thank you, Julianne, and uh, again, thank you for the compliments on IPI's on work on this. We're going to have to, I don't know, steal Alice <laughs> back, I think, uh, uh, based upon all the compliments that we're getting for her uh, great, great work. Um, I think it's very helpful, this, uh, this point that you make, that these, these seven challenges are many, many ways can be narrowed down to two types of impact, efficiency and impartiality. Uh, we keep hearing again and again, I mean, the real... Uh, the real burden of due diligence that is put on the humanitarian actors in order to uh, avoid uh, being on the wrong side of a sanctions regime. And um, I think your point about uh, the role the Security Council could play, uh, some of the committees perhaps, on providing better implementation guidelines, I think is a very important point and perhaps could be uh, helpful. And um, on impartiality, I think we're seeing here in the report and your, your comments this real challenge to humanitarian principles that what in effect you are having is decisions being made not on a prioritization based upon need but upon uh, the uh, you know possibility of avoiding risk and as you say in the context where humanitarian actors are are operating it's not possible to operate with a zero zero risk and uh, and that is a is should be a grave concern to, to all of us um, we've got plenty of time for a Q&A. We've still got a very full room, which I'm happy to see. And um, the floor is open. We can take uh, a few questions at once. Let's go straight all the way to the back there, Amanda, right there. Yeah. Hi, my name is Richard Burt. I work for the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent. I just wanted to ask the panel, you know, things have got better. I, I would 
not agree with that. So I don't think it's ever been so bad. I think the politicization of humanitarian space and the complexity of operating has never been like it is now. And that is deeply problematic for impartial and effective and safe humanitarian action. And sanctions play an important role in the CT issues in that. And the second point is this agenda weakens the role of local actors. Because passing, you know, people don't want to work with local actors because they can't be trusted. Well, if you want to start to create a counterweight and change a dynamic in a very dangerous and difficult place, you want women's NGOs, you want local actors that are taking on the humanitarian agenda. But actually what this does is it ensures that all the resources end up in the UN or the big international NGOs as a way of managing risk for the donors. And the interest in local actors is almost zero. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, can thank you. Um, th this is Manik Mehta. I'm a syndicated journalist. Uh, I like the title Smart Sanctions. It's very appealing. But uh, in hindsight, how would you make sanctions against uh, regimes in countries like Iran, in North Korea, and now also Myanmar, how would you make them smarter? Would you like to explain, please? Thank you. We take one more question for this round. Anyone? No? Okay, well, we got, uh, got two, two good questions. One is a challenge that it is getting better. Um, and also the uh, question surrounding local actors. And then maybe a bit more um, detail on the, on the question of how to make these smarter. Um, yeah, go for it. Um, I apologize if, if what I said came across as that the situation was getting better. In fact, I think the situation, based on the anecdotes, um, has indeed gotten worse. What has gotten better is at least people being aware that there's a problem and beginning to have the dialogue to understand the problem. But again, while we've been talking and understanding each other, the situation has gotten worse and the real cost on individuals has, has risen. So I, I um, uh, apologize if I came across the wrong way. Um, on the, um, on the, the how the UN can make things smarter, if you will, um, I'm going to hearken to the fact that the only, of the regimes you mentioned, the only ones in which there are UN sanctions is DPRK. Um, Myanmar and Iran, in fact, are um, US and EU sanctions, so they're not really um, something that have the Chapter 7 mandate. On DPRK, I think what was very helpful was in the panel of expert reports last March that was released, not the most recent one, but there were detailed annexes talking about what the impact was on various um, sectors and various individuals. And that's the first time that we've really had a detailed analysis um, I understand it was not without some controversy that the annex was in the, the report, but I think it's another example of when you ask the questions and the panel has to address them, you can find some of the information. You can begin understanding the, um, the nature of the problem. Again, I just caution that you know everybody wants data, but we already know there's a problem. So it's good to have the information about what the impact is and how it's manifesting itself, but we should not have that be the, uh, the focus of the discussion. It should be on actually solving the problem. Maybe just a, a couple of lines. In terms of uh, donor funding agreements, I think we have uh, found things to be a little bit more difficult than they have been in the past. Um, and uh, as I say, the request for certain clauses to go into uh, the agreement um, uh, generates an awful lot of discussion. It's normal to have discussion with your donors about how best to carry out the activities, and it's something that we really, we really strive to do. Uh, but we've, we've faced certain pressures on how to carry out our work. As I said in the, uh, uh, in, in the uh, intervention, uh, that it, it pushes you a bit away from government areas. So. Uh, that, I think, that type of pressure, I felt, uh, at least f from, from colleagues that have been doing this for, uh, for quite a few years, I think is a, is a bit new. And I'd say we have felt a little bit on the criminalization of staff, I think, pressures in an area more on the CT side than on violations of sanctions regimes. But they're linked because there are some, of course, some uh, sanctions regimes, notably uh, 
1267, which, which relate to counterterrorism activities. So there is a bit of an overlap. And so I think we have seen some increase. I fully, accept, I fully agree as well, uh, Richard, on your comment about where it's felt most strongly. And that includes um, local NGOs doing extremely good work, uh, the Dennis Mukwege's of the world in Congo, who, whose organizations may not have the resources that, that the Federation or, or the, the ICRC have to be able to have these kinds of discussions to try to resolve problems. And so when those problems go unresolved, maybe you don't hear about them as much. Um, but I think that's a very good point that should be borne in mind. Yes, I, I would also fully second that point on, on the different, differentiated impact depending on, on what organization, what type of, of organization we're talking about. Uh, actually, you have some big INGOs, UN agencies, which usually are able to continue to, to, to operate and to use some banking channels, but the most affected are the local organizations, local NGOs, and in contexts like Syria, they, they are the ones who deliver, quite, fr quite frankly. Let's not forget that. So. As the UN, big INGOs, we have also a responsibility to, 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 to make their voices heard, to, 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 to relay, to convey their, their, their concerns, and, and to, to, to find a way to, 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 con to help them uh, continue doing what they are doing, because without them, we, we, we just don't deliver. Uh, on the issue of, um, of the sanctions regime that, 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 that you, sir, mentioned, um, it goes back a little bit to to, to the remark uh, I was uh, I was mentioning of uh, of the special rapporteur on, on the uh, on unilateral coercive measures that some sanctions regimes you could argue are still not intended to be smart. I mean, what does it mean for a sanctions regime to be targeted if you have 155 targets in the same country and that includes the government, central bank, and all the, all the financial sector? All sanctions, you could argue, are not designed today, are still not designed to be smart, which makes it easier to make them smarter, arguably. Uh, let me just add to what Julian said. Uh, um, I think that, um, I think in, in many ways, we're unlearning the lessons that we learned that led to targeted sanctions. And that is that you, uh, the broader they are, the more comprehensive impact. Libya sanctions, um, after, when initially imposed, uh, went to the central bank and then to the uh, petroleum uh, entity, I believe. And as such, it almost created a crisis for the sanctions committee because it was all of a sudden it started impacting students who were, were studying. Um, and it was, a, it was quite a, a, a crisis that needed to be resolved. However, now in DPRK, we've never had a sanctions regime which is as comprehensive. It covers not only individuals, it covers sectors. It, it is an enormously comprehensive um, sanctions regime. And that's why some of the impacts are being felt. Um, just two other things. Um, on the um, where humanitarian actors do their business, I've actually had some say that the, it's determined by banks, where they can get the money transferred, and that they have withdrawn from certain areas that they know the banks will not transfer the funds. And then finally, Absolutely, the last mile delivery is critically important. And in fact, what we're seeing right now also with the grand bargain, do you remember the grand bargain? That 25% is supposed to be delivered um, to local actors. Well, um, and, 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 and the move to cash programming too. None of that has sort of affected the sanctions regime. There've been no discussions about how you actually do some of these things. So it, again, even more reason why to bring these, these parties together and sit down to discuss what can be done. Thanks. Uh, yes, I have uh, one here. Thank you. My name is Nina Nurhena. I'm from the uh, Mission of Finland. Um, thank you very much for the organizers, and thank you for the, for the very good uh, research. Um, we think that this sort of the selection of the countries is very good, because from the donor's point of view, we have also experienced that uh, there are difficulties, uh, where especially with these, these areas. Um, I would like to especially uh, thank uh, Harland from the ICRC for pointing out the, the council conclusions for the European Union. Uh, Finland was the, the presidency of the European Union last fall, and, and that was sort of the first time that we brought together the, the uh, counterterrorism and the humanitarian experts. And there was also Alice de Barre from the IPI, uh, IPI um, uh, briefing uh, the working parties in Brussels. So uh, thank you very much for that. It was very useful and uh, indeed the council conclusions was a significant uh, uh, decision to sort of uh, 
uh, highlight the importance of the maker action not be prevented with by counterterrorism and sanctions. Thank you very much. We'll come up to, let's get the, in the front of the room here involved in the second row. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hirit. I work for the Belgian mission here in New York. I'm the humanitarian expert. Um, uh, only highlighting first that this issue, of course, is very important to us uh, as well. Um, as a non-permanent member of the Security Council, we've been only following this or me, I've been following this for the past year um, on behalf of my country. Um, we organized a high-level event on this together with EU ECHO, um, actually only with the only aim to bring this to the attention of a higher political level to um, overcome the, the silos uh, recently. Um, throughout the past year, um, I think what you guys meant with progress was also the attention that is given to the to the issue and i i can say over the f last or two last years there has been progress on that um everybody including um usg logog has already mentioned how we've come from far and uh, we're not talking anymore about um confirming that there is an issue now we're talking about solutions um, and that's actually what I indeed like about the report of Alice, that she um, gives practical recomm recommendations to all stakeholders, not just some. Um, because I think one of the issues now is that we're all passing on the hot potato. Um, and speaking as a non-permanent member of the Security Council, now I could go into the importance of the recommendations for the UN and the private sector, which would be easier for me. Um, <laughs> But speaking of the role of the Security Council, like Julien mentioned, um, sorry, my cell phone is, I'm just gonna put it here. <laughs> um, I just wanted to come back to what Julien just said of the role of the Security Council, um, which is a little bit more complex than just speaking about the role of the Security Council. As a non-permanent member, I can say that when you come in as an incoming member, your knowledge on this issue might not be as it should be, um, or not as, uh, in, in any case, not on the same level as the P5. So um, it's not only about acknowledging it, it's then it, when you're talking about regimes, we're talking about which regime, which solution, what is legally possible, what is a solution that is legally possible, which which solution is politically possible, mm -hmm. and then we're already in our second year. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then I come back to the support that is needed from the UN system. Um, you cannot just throw back the ball and say Security Council is, is one of the biggest solutions. They, the members of that Security Council, need support from the UN. Um, and then I refer back to the IPI report who mentions roles for SCAT and OCHA. There I would be interested how we as a non-permanent member can push SCAT and OCHA to play this role in supporting future incoming members better or the current P5 um, to play their role a little bit better and really pragmatically. Um, this all to avoid this panel repeating the same speeches in two years from now for a different audience and coming to the same conclusions. Um, also on a pragmatic front, uh, my question to Ms. Eckert would be if you could um, enlighten me on, on the current evolutions in the banking sector, are there um, processes ongoing that are positive, dialogues that we can learn from or that we can support? so that the banking sector also makes progress. Thank you. Great, great, thank you. And if I could take one more question, Ms. Brown, and I think we should hopefully have uh, time for, if, if, we're, if we're brief, we can have time for another one more round. Yes, sir, please. Yeah. Yes, uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Omar Nakur, uh, ambassador at the Libyan mission. Uh, since you have brought the Libyan case, although it is not uh, actually related directly to the humanitarian aspects, uh, but uh, I would tell you that uh, we're still uh, losing a lot of our assets, although the uh, intention of the sanction regime is to preserve the assets. Not, it is not a punitive measure. It is a preventive measure. And what's happening since 2016, we are calling for the Security Council to modify. It is really a rigid regime, is not smart, and uh, we are starving to... Uh, 
to try to convince them to, to look at the situation losing uh, hundreds of million per year, actual loss, uh, plus the uh, opportunity cost. So the Libyan uh, sanction uh, regime is still uh, very bad and uh, very rigid. Thank you. Great. Well, so you've got a direct question. Would you like to respond to that? Yes. Um, as part of these multi-stakeholder dialogues that are taking place in various countries, uh, the financial sector is there. And there have been a number of banks which have made um, serious commitment to working on these issues and, in fact, um, helping uh, um, NPOs or charities be able to work in sanctioned countries. Um, the UK is one process. The, the Dutch are leading another roundtable process. Um, the World Bank uh, undertook this in, in the U.S. in, in uh, consultation and in cooperation with ACAMS, which are the anti-money laundering specialists, certified uh, specialists. Um, so I think the banks are willing to come to the table, but by the same token, the banks need to see concrete action because, um, for example, one of the origins of this problem is that in um, the early, just after 9-11, the Financial Action Task Force created a special recommendation, eight, about the risk of nonprofit organizations. Well, over time, the situation changed. In 2016, they actually fundamentally changed the recommendation. But there's been nothing to implement in many member states. Um, and the banks say, well, we understand FAATF has revised the risk uh, you know, associated with NPOs, but there's nothing in our regulatory process. In the US, we've actually proposed regu regulatory language to change how NPOs are um, assessed. The World Bank has actually created a tool. It's, this week, it's being <coughs> test run um, to help member states assess the risk of their nonprofit sector. And that's required by FATF, and that's, that's an important part. But I would say that the private sector is ready and willing to come to the table. Um, but they also need progress. I mean, talk, uh, you know, they get frustrated with a lot of talk and not seeing any action. Um, do you want to go on to the other questions, Aaron? Sure, absolutely. Um, the, um, in terms of uh, SCAD and OCHA, um, when we did the high-level review, we actually had a process in, uh, called that was created by the Secretariat called the um, Informal Working Group. Is that what it's called? IWG. And it was created to bring all parts of the UN together to have a discussion about sanctions and about what could be done, how the different parts could work together better. But nothing has happened with that in the, since the high-level review um, was uh, rolled out several years ago. So there's not a sustained dialogue on these issues, even within the, the secretariat. And I, I let Julian address specifically the OCHA-related question. Thank you. Very happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's strange to respond to a question on how you know the Security Council could, could push OCHA to <coughs> to increase its involvement. I would say that, that there's many aspects to, to 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 these questions because there, there's many roles that 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 we we could play and maybe should not some of them we should not play. I think um, if it's in terms of just sharing expertise with incoming Security Council members, if it's in terms of sensitizing incoming Security Council members to humanitarian issues related to the implementation of sanctions, we can certainly do that, and we're always happy, uh, I, I guess, to to do that. At some point, we used to participate in the annual workshop that SCAD organized for sanctions experts. So I think that th th there are things that are in place that are maybe not well known, that maybe we need to reactivate and work more closely with SCAD in order to have that kind of humanitarian dimension. Uh, integrated, fully integrated to, 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 to the offer of, of services they propose to incoming Security Council members because, they, to my knowledge, they still do um, provide these um, these services. So that that's m one type of thing that, that 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 we could do when it comes. And I saw uh, in in Alice's report. I mean, uh, that's a great report, but there's maybe a couple of recommendations I would have doubts on, in particular in terms of what OCHA's role should be in terms of systematic monitoring and reporting on this issue. First, when it comes to unilateral sanctions, having a, a role, an explicit role on this, it's the door open to politicization, and I'm not sure that that role should be given to any humanitarian organization, quite frankly, um, because it, it would have 
operational uh, implications. We don't have a mandate to do that, and as Alice notes in, in, in the report, we don't have the capacities, the capabilities to, to, to do that. Uh, on unilateral sanctions, there's a UN mandate, uh, the, the special rapporteur uh, on the impact of uh, unilateral coercive measures, who also can, can do a lot of things. When it comes to UN sanctions, I think it will be more a job for sanctions committees. But I would obs observe that neither OCHA nor sanctions committees have the necessary resources and expertise to really monitor systematically on the humanitarian impact of sanctions. So there's a huge question of resources, and actually SCAD admitted to it openly. Um, the, the last report on uh, on the implementation of the of the charter the quotes uh, SCAD as saying that they would need much more resources to do that. So there's a real question of resources, and here. I mean, I don't want to, why not, you know, um, e exchanging uh, reproaches or anything, but I think there would be a role for member states to provide whoever they want uh, to, 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 to be tasked with this, to provide these entities with the necessary resources. And again, I would seriously caution about um, any idea of giving a formal role to any humanitarian entity on this very political issue. I don't think it's particularly a good idea. Uh, yes, I just, the, on, the, on the question of training, though, mm -hmm. the high-level review really was supposed to provide um, greater impetus for training for incoming members, for non-permanent members. And there was um, discussions, and there was, for example, now there are at least, I, from what I understand, briefings and handoff of one chair to the next in the incoming chair. But clearly, from what you're expressing, it, it's not enough. Um, for, for member states to really be able to take up the mantle. These are very complicated issues. Um, oftentimes it takes many people to implement them. It's not like there's one or two people in the mission, but people back home as well. I do believe the Security Council report still does a training, don't they? And then the, and SCAD does a training, but clearly capacity is for incoming members as well as then member states to implement these is a huge issue which does need to be addressed. Great, thank you. I, I saw Two more hands up that I that I would uh, like to get in. Yes, here in the third row here to the right. And then we've just got a few more minutes, so if you could be brief uh, to the right, yeah, and then. Thank you, and uh, first I would like to thanks for uh, IPI and, and the German mission to organize the, this report. I also want to pay tribute to the work of Alice for this fantastic report. I think this is one of the more comprehensive reports uh, dealing with sanction and humanitarian action, compared with previous works that were more focused on counterterrorism. Uh, I also want to, to highlight uh, this conversation that has taken place a few minutes ago, the, 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 the real importance that, uh, that, we, uh, that we give to have a well-documented uh, data on the impact uh, of unsanctioned humanitarian action. And, and I think this will be good to have a, a, this conversation, how we could improve this evidence without compromising the neutrality of any organization. I think something that we could definitely discuss. Um, of course, we agreed on the balance uh, of having a, of the object of the sanctions and having a, 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 a sanction that ha can allow the, the work of a humanitarian organizations from the from the European Union. This is something that uh, really we 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 we, we give a, a lot of attention. This topic, uh, the, the the last conclusion of the European Council have been mentioned, but the other initiatives that we are trying to 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 bring forward, uh, apart from the advocacy role that we try to play uh, in Brussels, but also in, in New York. Uh, we have elaborated this sanction map for uh, for actors. That is, I, I, I recommend everybody to 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 uh, consult. Uh, we are has been mentioned doing the multi-stakeholder compliance dialogue with Syria, and I will be very happy to share information about this and the possible uh, recommendations that uh, that uh, that we provide. We are also uh, providing a number of uh, frequent uh, asking questions about Syria and how we can help our partners in order to uh, comply with our requirements in terms of, of, of funding. Um, finally, I think that, uh, again, I want to just simply to, to thank for, for this report. It contains a number of recommendations that we, uh, at least from, from Brussels, will, will, will read very carefully and try to definitely follow up. Great, thank you. We can take one more question there right across there. <coughs> Uh, thank you. My name is David McKeever. I work with CTED. Um, as was mentioned earlier, we're and following some of the council resolutions last year. Uh, we're looking more and more at the impact of counterterrorism measures generally on, on delivery of humanitarian assistance. Uh, many thanks to the panel and thanks to IPI, supported by Germany and Alice, not just for this report, but for the others in the series, all of which have been very useful. Um, one quick comment and then, then a question, if I may, please. Um, 
One way in which I think this report is particularly helpful for, from our perspective is that it really identifies the multiple and overlapping legal regimes which regulate this matter and the complexities which arise from that. Um, the different legal standards, different definitions, different processes, and, and so on. And from a UN perspective, obviously there are a number of Security Council committees, each charged with overseeing an individual regime, and obviously focusing on that individual regime. But member states have to deal with all of it. Aid agencies have to deal with all of it. Financial institutions have to deal with all of it. Just trying to digest all of it is, is a lot of work. But then having to legislate or having to operationalize all of it is, is, is increasingly important. And again, from our perspective, I think as we move forward, this, this report really illustra illustrates for us why this complexity matters, and we need to have that in mind. Um, the question is sort of the flip side of that. The fact that there are multiple regimes and the fact that I think, as Sue mentioned, this issue has been around for a while means that there are some important lessons we can draw on. And one specific example which is made in the report is that in the DPK, DPRK uh, system, I think if I understood it correctly, uh, over the course of one year, the amount of time it took to process an exemption request went from 99 days to 15 days. That's a remarkable development, I think. So my question would be whether that improvement, that shortening of the period, I mean, how did this arise? Was it just because there was better guidance? made available to the entities seeking the exemptions or whether other factors. And so if the panel could speak to that specifically or indeed other cases where the timeframes for processing these exemptions uh, have improved significantly, that'd be very helpful for us just moving forward. Thank you. Great, thanks. Excellent question right, right at the end. Um, I think if we, uh, maybe if we'll uh, kind of, why don't we give uh, Chris the first sure. word and this will be your, First in response to the question, also a last word, no words, and then uh, and then we'll we'll go to Sue and Julian for final words, and uh, and we'll wrap up. So. Good. No, thanks very much. Uh, thanks for the support of the EU, of course, uh, on a number of fronts, um, and then maybe just uh, with respect to the DPRK, um, I think where we've seen a few challenges have been where there have been differences uh, between, let's say, the the UN process and then separate national restrictions. Um, which have meant that we've had to do multiple uh, different clearances, licensing clearances. So you're looking at, of course, the UN structure here, reporting back to some of the capitals through the UN system, and then you might have a separate regime that another state might have with respect to the DPRK. So you have to go through that procedure. And then you've got normally clearance through Beijing, and then that's an additional issue. So. Uh, uh, it may be that there are areas where the UN clearance has worked. It just happens to be that in some of the areas, because we have a delegation in Pyongyang, so we're, we're trying to deliver whatever we can uh, through through our programming there. And I think that's that's been our complicated factor, has been the, let's say, the multiple systems. And of course, I won't get into banking, but you can imagine that that's a separate issue as well. So. Um, on the DPRK, I think that's a, a longer discussion about how they, they um, brought some of these changes about. I, needless to say, I think part of it was a dialogue of understanding better what the problems were, and then having a specific mandate to address those problems. Um, and I think that they, they've done a very good job, but there is no question about the challenges from multiple jurisdictions. And in fact, in here, um, the, the term OFAC, the word OFAC usually sends chills down people's spine. It's our licensing agency um, for US sanctions. But they actually are very efficient in um, addressing a licensing request. And in fact, they have a, a standing policy which says if there are inadvertent violations of sanctions, that that's not um, a basis for enforcement action. So, there, in that, I think, are some things that you can use as general principles that could be applied on a broader basis. But there's no question that the complexity of these being done at the EU, UN, you know, unilateral sanctions really does make it difficult. Yeah, just, just to add very quickly that uh, I'm by no means an expert on DPRK. Um, but but one, one of the characteristics of, of the DPRK sanctions regime and the work of the DPRK sanctions committee is that they are very private to the issue of humanitarian consequences. It's integrated in the regime. The regime says itself that it's not intended to have humanitarian consequences. This is something that is integrated to the regime and the sanctions committee is 
expected to look into those issues. So that might be a, re a lesson learned. If you have a possibility of licensing in a regime, if you have humanitarian issues clearly, explicitly um, addressed uh, in Security Council resolution and clear expectations from the sanctions committee and the panel of experts that th these issues should be reported on, then maybe you increase your chances that the sanctions committee is at some point going to take action in order to make things a bit smoother. And then my other, uh, I mean, it's not been um, mentioned uh, too much during this, this, this event because usually it's a, it's a way to not talk about all the rest, but obviously political will. I mean, at some point, the members of the sanctions committee found that kind of agreement in the in, in the sanctions committee that allowed for for progress. Maybe I should mention also that um, a couple, I mean, more a dozen of humanitarian briefings to the sanctions committee over the past years may have helped to 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 trigger these changes. Great, thank you so much. Uh, uh, this has been an incredibly rich conversation and, and I, I won't attempt to sum up, but one of the takeaways that I come out from this is that if there is debate about whether we've made progress or not, I think we can all agree that you know, one of the first steps is a recognition that there is a problem in order to address it. And I think that uh, we've seen uh, quite ample evidence that there are incredible challenges. And, um, and those are challenges that no single actor can really uh, grapple on their own, that this is really a multi-stakeholder issue. This point at the end about the multiple overlapping legal regimes and the complexity that comes out from that really requires uh, a real um, multi-stakeholder dialogue and commitment and recognition that there really is a shared interest in the effective implementation of sanctions regimes while at the same time enabling and facilitating and supporting humanitarian action. And I think that's something that, that there is a real collective interest um, and a view to uh, improve in the future. So uh, we hope to be seized, uh, remain seized of this issue. And uh, thank you all for coming. And thank you all to the panel. Thank you, Alex. <laughs>